Hello, yes, that's right, it's Joe here, live for Joyride TV, back with some very exciting Q&A from the Wildwind Studio, uh, not the Wildwind Studios, the Joyrider TV studios, where the lighting is always seeming to evolve to something else. Um, uh, today, I've got the light up there, the big one, um, so just trying to make that work, but um, yeah, so always different with the lights it's my biggest struggle in the studio anyway hello so what we're here for is some live q and a and um where i'm going to be answering your catamaran sailing questions and um i thought i might just steam straight in with this week's featured topic you may have noticed in the last few weeks that i'm having a featured topic each week. Uh, today's featured topic is helming on the trapeze, um, especially if you haven't um, tried helming on the trapeze before, or perhaps uh, you've tried it and it wasn't a favourable experience. Uh, perhaps um, something bad happened while you were trying to get out on the trapeze, or perhaps you're already established helming on the trapeze, but you're not totally happy with your transition from the boat to out. So that is going to start off by having a look with. After we've done that, I'll check in with everybody who's tuning in live. Uh, it's nice to have everybody uh, on board today, of course. So first thing, helming on the trapeze. Before getting out onto the water, I think it's a very good idea to um, spend a bit of time on the beach, just getting used to the feeling that you're going to be feeling. Um, so let's call this some prerequisites almost of, of giving it a burn. Um, first one is, have you trapezed as a crew before you're gonna try trapezing as a helm? If you've got the opportunity for somebody else um, to come out with you on the boat and for them to helm the boat so that you can uh, just practice trapezing as the crew, that is going to make trapezing as the helm a huge amount easier because you're already going to know what it feels like to be out on the trapeze. I think that is a very good starting point. Um, so if you're unable to get somebody to come out on the boat with you, or if you've already trapezed as a crew, next step as a sort of pre-practice thing that you should do is just practice getting out on the trapeze on with your boat on the land. Just make sure that your boat is sat on something comfortable. Um, like I would have it certainly sat with the... Um, with the front of the boat on the trolley, back of the boat on, if you've got some nice hull supports, if not on some something that isn't going to damage the hull. Or if it's a sandy beach, on the sandy beach would be fine. But you can just practice going in and out over and over again, just to try to get that feeling of transitioning from the boat to the trapeze as steady as possible. Uh, both sides as well. Because pretty much everyone has a better side for trapezing. And um, yeah, so it's good to work your bad side as well as your good side. Very important, of course. So once you've done that, then it's time to get out on the water and give it a go for real. And uh, what we're trying to do is make it as easy as possible. So trapeze gear so your trapeze height um if we just if this is the side of the boat here if this is your trapeze wire what i would suggest is if you haven't done much helming on the trapeze before have your trapeze wire a bit shorter so this is where you hook into so that when you're sat on the side of the boat, um, 
I don't even know how to illustrate this. I won't bother. When you're sat on the side of the boat, you have to kind of lift yourself up a little bit to get into the hook. That means that as you're going out onto the trapeze, um, it's much less, well, it's going to be fairly impossible to come unhooked. That, for me, um, still, I'm always wary of coming unhooked when I move out onto the trapeze, because obviously coming unhooked has some fairly significant uh, consequences if that happens. So um, having the trapeze short enough, so you have to kind of lift yourself up a bit to hook in. And then when you sit down again, you can you can already see that the wire is tight. Good starting point. So once you've got there, what next? OK, we want to have the boat sailing on a very stable course with a good amount of distance. Um, so if you're sailing on a lake or a smaller body of water, um, just try to put yourself with as long stretch to go as possible before you're going to have to throw in a maneuver just so you've got plenty of time because that really is going to help. Um, and then the actual point of sale that you um, are going to want to be on is going to be like here um, or even like here. So this is the wind. We want to be sailing upwind or um, or on a close reach, so just a little bit away from upwind, those are the best two kind of points of sail. If we're going on a beam reach, like half wind, square to the wind, the boat is going to sail much more quickly on that course. It's going to make it feel much more volatile, much more like, oh my goodness, uh, we've got a bit on. Um, what you don't want to feel is that you've got a bit on before you even look at going out on the trapeze. So get the boat on a nice stable point of sail. Upwind is the best because on the upwind point of sail, you can, you've got the best ability to have the main sheet in tight. And then from having the main sheet in tight, you can then steer the boat to control the power. So you don't need to be playing the main sheet as much. Whereas on a reaching course, you're going to have to play a lot more main sheet. So upwind point of sail, um, plenty of space. Um, plenty of space. And then we're ready to take it to the next stage. And the next stage, if you've seen any of the Helming on the Trapeze video, uh, uh, you'll be familiar with this as my concept. I think it's, um, it's a a Joyrider TV uh, special move. So if this is the toe strap here, going down the boat, um, it's a good idea, incidentally, on the topic of toe straps, if your trampoline, if your toe straps uh, stitch into the trampoline, maybe uh, if you're putting your boat away for the winter, getting them re-stitched or even... Treat your, treat your trampoline to some new toe straps, perhaps in a fairly jazzy colour. Um, that really gives your trampoline a bit of a facelift. Not, that, not particularly expensive to do. Probably about 20 euros for a new pair of toe straps on your trampoline. They're stitched in. Um, and then if you've got new, new toe straps fitted or if you've had your old toe straps re-stitched, that's going to give you more confidence. Um, of course, if you your toe straps um, anchor to the back beam, then you're not going to have that issue quite so much of worrying about the stitching. All right, that's enough about toe straps. So from here, we're going to get into our half trapezing position. And if this is the shroud here, I would suggest being about halfway between the shroud and the back beam. That's just going to give you the most space to work with. So uh, let's draw our sailor on board here. There's the toe under the strap, another toe under the strap. And we're going to shuffle out. So our buttocks 
are over the edge of the boat. This chap is particularly tall and his head is kind of upside down. Never mind. All right. So that would be position one uh, hooked in. Hooked in, toes under the toe strap, hanging your buttocks over the edge of the boat and just getting comfortable in that position. And at all times, number one focus is stay in control of the boat. So as if you were sitting on the side of the boat, um, main sheet, tiller, main focus. Uh, most important is your course, just keeping your course as constant as possible, getting this half trapezing, hanging over the edge position. You can sail there in that position all day long if you had enough space, of course, and um, just get comfortable there. First stage. Then from that position, once you feel that you really are very much in control of the boat, there's two different ways that we can come back it, uh, that we can um, go out. So either front foot first or back foot first. Now, for me, I like to go back foot first if I'm further forwards on the boat. So if I'm sailing upwind or front foot first, if I'm more towards the back of the boat, just because, as you may know, when you're trapezing, the further back you come on the boat, the more of a pull there is forwards. So if you go out with your front foot first, you are already resisting that pull straight away as soon as you're pushing out on the trapeze. And the opposite applies. If you're sailing upwind and you're further forwards on the boat, you might feel more of a pull towards the front of the boat, um, sorry, towards the back of the boat, which means going out with your back foot first really does help because you're already resisting against uh that pull yeah all right so um there are many ways that you can um organize your hands for going out if you're already hanging there i personally am quite happy um if i'm going out uh back foot first because i'm further forwards on the boat to go out without actually using any hands on the trapeze wire, just uh, bring your back foot up onto the side. And if you, um, where's me rubber? Oh, we're, we're experiencing drama here. All right, found it. It's all right. If, so from that position, next position is to put your foot onto the side of the boat. Right, and we're going back foot first in this instance. So that knee is going to, to be bent. And then even while we're there, we should still, although our chap here does look like one of his legs is much um, longer than the other one. Um, we should be able to get our back foot on the side of the boat with the front foot still under the toe strap. So you can try sailing along in that position once you're there. Now, if you're finding that your back, um, whichever foot you're putting on the side of the boat, if you don't bend like that. Um, so if you were like absolutely dead square to the boat, if you were going to try to get your foot like that, you would need fairly decent uh, flexibility. So, um, yes yoga lessons needed but not everybody's got the time or the inclination for those yoga lessons so instead a good trick is just to really twist your whole body so rather than um here we go we'll use some color so i'd have to keep rubbing it out um rather than going out totally square like that what we can do if we're going back foot first almost twist how can i draw this um twist your whole body so that you're kind of angled almost like you're naturally facing the back a little bit because that will already bring your back foot 
closer to the side of the boat. Of course, if you're going out front foot first, that will be the opposite. Same if you're the crew um, going out on the trapeze. Twist your whole body round, and that will bring your foot, which you're going to lead with, almost level with the side of the boat before you push out. So there we go. Um, and then once you get your foot on the side, then it's a case of just deciding when you're going to go for it. And then we come back to um, most important point, which is focus on controlling the boat. All the way through this, controlling the boat is number one. So just really focus on your steering. Um, just try to steer for the gusts if you can. Um, if things start, if the boat starts moving quite quickly, just sail a little bit closer to the wind. Um, and you could sail really pretty close to the wind as long as you keep focusing on your course as you go along. There we go. And then you're going to give it the good push to get the other foot out onto the side, focusing on your steering. And then there you are. All right. So I'm just skimming through the live chat on people's comments on helming on the trapeze. Um, all right. So um, Hanny says, I find it difficult to come back in the boat if you have a lot of speed. Yes. All right. We'll come on to that now. Um, and Paul um, says he's got a good old C2. Very nice choice. Uh, helming on the wire is nerve wracking. Yeah. Hopefully by, you know, if you get your boat onto a good upwind point of sail um, where you're really taking the speed off as much as possible, but keeping a bit of power on, that should hopefully take part of the nerve wracking feeling out of it. And then having the trapeze set quite short um, really does help as well. So then once you're out and you want to come back in, yes, this can be a bit of a trick shot. So if you've once you've been out on the trapeze, if you thought, OK, let's go for a bit of a reach, get this baby going. Um, before you come back in, same as when you're going out, let's take the boat back onto an upwind point of sail. So we're really slowing things down because the thing is, when you're going fast, if you try coming in when you're going fast, what happens when you're going fast is because of the amount of water going over the rudders, it becomes so much more sensitive, um, like the steering, that if you do give the rudders a little tweak when you're coming in, something is much more likely to happen. And also, if you're not sailing upwind and you do have the accidental bear away slightly when you're coming in off the trapeze, then you are more likely to stick the nose in as you're coming in. So keep it upwind when you're coming in as well. And then when you're ready to come in, what I would do for security is take the main sheet out of the cleat. Here we go. Oh, we go. It's pretty specific here. Main sheet out of the cleat. Reach down the tiller extension as far as you can. Look at this 3D. Whoa. As far as you can. Main sheet and tiller extension in the same hand. Now you're committed. Means things are going to happen. Uh, with the main sheet uncleated. That means if you do get the monster gust, you can just open your hand a little bit, let a bit of main sheet out, and then clutch it back on. And then grab the handle with the front hand and then just pull yourself back in. There we go. Yeah. One other point. Um, we see quite a lot of out here with people on holiday who haven't done much trapezing at all, who aren't so used to wearing the trapeze harness, is it doesn't matter how sh what how short you set your trapeze line if your trapeze harness isn't done up tight enough. So it should be that your trapeze hook is level with where your belt would be on your trousers. Um, and if on the land, if you pull the hook away from you, you shouldn't be able to pull it away so that you can see a gap there. If there's a gap there, what that effectively does is makes this much lower down, which is going to make it much, much harder. 
perhaps if you are of the um, larger persuasion, um, set the trapeze height even shorter, that is going to make it a lot easier again. So like I said, you want to set the height here so that um, you have to pull yourself up a bit to hook on. And once you're sat back down on the side of the boat, you can't actually unhook without lifting yourself up a bit. There we go. So I hope that is helpful to everybody in the um, helming on the trapeze department. I think this does apply to everyone and um, we can always improve. Like with normal trapezing, if you want to be more stable on the trapeze, have your feet wider apart. But as you become more confident or if you feel very stable, bring your feet closer together. There we go. All right. So I'm going to check in with everybody in the live chat. Uh, thanks for coming. All right. We've got Benny on board in Sweden. He says uh, cold today. Winter is coming. Yeah. Um, I tell you what, you will notice um, that woolly hat has gone on. That is because it really does feel like we have hit winter here in uh, sunny Greece. It has been absolutely pounding it down with rain for two whole days now. And um, it is so windy at the moment. I am worried that the, uh, the roof is going to come off the house. And um, I've still got Bad Boy 94 on the beach. Uh, mast is down. She's tied down very securely. But it's not the boat I'm worried about. This is the thing. If you have your boat out in the open over the winter and there's a lot of wind, it's not about your boat. It's about someone else's boat coming and having a go at your boat. Or if there's no other boats there, like in my situation, it might not be a boat that comes and has a go at your boat. It might be a tree. Um, I'm a little bit nervous because I've been away for a couple of days. So um, I haven't had the opportunity to uh, go and check. But I did tie her down very securely before I went away. So, um, yeah, there we go. There's a weather update from sunny, not so sunny Greece. Um, it's raining so much. There's like uh, some sort of small floods in the roads everywhere where there's not a hill. All right, we got ABR19096. Uh, Beach, greetings from Delaware, USA. Great to have you on board. Um, Hanny is with us in Amsterdam. If you're in the live chat and you are wondering, why is it that some people, their name is in green and everyone else is in a kind of grey or white? Uh, the green ones are everyone who's a channel member of Joyrider TV. Um, it's a great way of supporting the channel and probably the most significant perk of being a channel member is as soon as I've finished making a video and I've uploaded it, um, I always make the videos go out um, at a similar time. But if you're a channel member, you get access to the video as soon as it's on there. So you might get it two days early. Nice. Um, if you can't wait, if you're a bit impatient for the videos like I am. Um, then we've got Roger on board, channel member. Nice to have you with us, Roger. Um, from a frigid Lake Erie. Uh, is that Would that be Canada or USA? Sorry, we have been around the world on Show Us Your Cat, but uh, it's been a while since been to Lake Erie. All right. We've got Stephen on board, I believe, uh, from Grafham Water, uh, UK. Kelso is with us from Brazil. All right. I, I'm hoping it's all good in Brazil right now, Kelso. Great to have you with us. We've got Ryan in Hawaii. Uh, good morning, Honey Cat MOG. Yeah, I'm um, still hoping for some... Uh, big speeds from you, Ryan. Um, I'm sure that you had a getaway uh, in your quiver and we're looking to, you know, not that I don't want Declan to win the getaway challenge, but if you're still able to get out on the water, you could be winning, the, by the way, the getaway challenge on the speed stick. If you didn't know, if you can get out on a getaway and if it's if basically, if you can get 20 knots, on the getaway, that's going to put you in first place. Whoever, at the end of the year, when the speed stick resets, whoever is the fastest getaway is going to win a Malcheski Composites 
Pro Joyrider Tiller Extension. Oh, yeah. Um, and I can tell you, that's a nice tiller extension. And I can tell you, it's even nicer when you want it by being the fastest getaway of the year. And next year in the speed stick, um, we're not going to have a getaway challenge. So this is the year of the getaway on the speed stick. There you go. All right. Um, yeah. Hello to Paul. Um, yeah. Whereabouts are you, Paul? Um, I just like to know. I find it interesting. All right. All right. This is a good one. Um, ABR 190 teabag you. Yes. Um, if you haven't trapezed before, if you do have the choice of who can steer your boat while you're trying trapezing as a crew, if you can take someone who is going to be in control, that is certainly going to be beneficial. Ryan said, having a trapeze adjuster and knowing how to use it is a win. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do is you can hook in and then you can shorten it so it's as short as it. If you've changed it while you've been out on the trapeze, you can shorten it again before you come back onto the boat. Ryan, maybe. Yeah, um, back during lockdown, um, we did... Uh, my wife if, uh, is a yoga teacher and, and um, we did. I was basically the guinea pig, the um, the stunt performer, and she was giving the instructions so everyone could follow along at home. But, yeah, I think um, we could definitely put out a yoga for sailors as perhaps not as a live video, but as a pre-recorded um, video. And I think if you're like me. Um, if you feel that putting an hour to doing stretching is possibly a bit much or three times a week, I think it's much better to do 10 or 15 minutes every day or at least every other day rather than doing one hour a week. I think that way you do feel an improvement. So um, perhaps I will speak to the yoga instructor of the house and see if we could put something together. Very nice. All right. Yeah. Uh, so, all right. ABR uh, says, I coach sailing blindfolded for my helms. I take all the cleats off my training boats. Um, so, um, yeah. Yeah. Who who gets blindfolded? Is it the person helming the boat or the person on the trapeze just to make it even more terrifying? No, um, no, that's a very good, uh, good scheme. All right. So Hanny says, yes, I'm going to try this. Hanny's heading out to Mauritius, which is um, oh, warming up a bit, which is where Wildwind has a second centre, which is really nice place to go sailing uh, in the uh, winter months of the northern hemisphere all right i says talk about uh ring and hook safety all right so yeah most important thing um with the trapeze hook and the trapeze ring is that your trapeze hook has got a quick release i think i actually um no i'll come on to this in a minute but um, what the quick release does on your trapeze hook is it means even if you're out on the, if it's under load, you can um, pull your quick release and the hook will actually come off, which means if you do find yourself stuck in a compromising position, you can get rid of the hook so that then you've got a much better idea of freeing yourself up. I'm not to be uh, saying anything that might come across as being slightly worrying, but I think it is a good topic to address uh, fairly often. Is if you, if you, um, here's our trampoline. So the trampoline is the thing that does make the catamaran reasonably dangerous especially if you capsize because and 
the thing that makes it the most dangerous is if the boat is capsizing sideways, if you happen to have somehow slid down the trampoline, uh, front facing the trampoline, so your hook going down the trampoline, there are many things that your hook could hook into. You could hook into the toe straps. You could hook in to the trampoline lacing. You could hook into the side of the trampoline if you have got this central tramp lacing or the other tramp. And then one of the worst things to hook into is if you go all the way down the boat. And it really is the worst luck because you couldn't do it if you tried. But if your hook gets stuck on the shroud and the boat capsizes, you can really feel yourself being pinned under the water, which is a horrible feeling. So to have a quick release hook on your um, trapeze harness, I think it should be le a legal requirement because um, to not have one is like driving a car without a seatbelt on. It is like you're really upping the chances of something quite bad happening. Um, and in fact, this is my story that I was going to tell. I um, I did have a kind of endorsement deal coming through with one of the sailing companies um, who makes trapeze harnesses and things. And I said to them, unfortunately, unless you can supply the trapeze harness with a quick release hook, I'm not going to be able to accept your offer. And uh, And that was that. I'm not going to say just it has got a quick release hook because I think um, the quick release systems are so good now that it is foolish not to have one. You can just buy the hook um, like with the bar and fit it to your older trapeze harness. So you don't have to splash out on a brand new one. But um, I think it really is very important to have that. For sure. All right. All right. So ABR continues. I have yahoos with their cats doing endos down the beach and not tied on. Yeah. Um, yes. Some people, they just don't know. First bit of wind. The mast up. Cool. It is it's a bad time. So if you didn't know, always tie the boat down. Best place to tie your boat down is um, if this is the front beam here, here's your dolphin striker here. Tie the boat down really tight, straight. Um, make, make sure your tie down point, so you have a tie down point and make sure that's directly beneath the dolphin striker. And what I like to do is actually to put a little loop in this rope. So the rope goes up, got a little loop, then the rope continues around the dolphin striker through the loop so you can actually get a purchase so you can really crank your boat down hard and then uh, go back up to the dolphin striker, tie it off up there. And then if you actually try lifting one of the bows of your boat, if it can move, um, it's not tight enough. And, um, you know, use don't use your old bit of rope that you had in your trailer for the last 30 years to tie your boat down with, because um, this rope, it can snap. So you don't need to have some Dyneema or something. But what I would suggest best for me is like a six to eight mil rope with a polyester core, which is new, replace it every year. Um, cause if you go too thick, it's not as easy to get it tight and not as easy to tie nice, a good knot in it. So um, about eight mil, six to eight mil rope, crank it down tight. And if you're going to be leaving your boat for more than, I'd say, two weeks, take your mast down as well. And then just tie your mast onto the boat. Um, then that's a bit more weight to uh, weigh your boat down. For sure. All right, so here we go. Um, oh, Roger is in USA, Ohio, and sales of Prindle 16 from 1981. 
yeah um i think when i go on the on the world tour which has been a long time coming i am going to track down some prindle sailors see if i can have a go on a prindle because um sorry to admit this but i have never sailed a prindle just not because i didn't want to it's just because there are not as many prindles in uh the uk and europe as there are in the usa uh not i don't think prindles were ever manufactured in europe well whereas hobies of course have had a massive manufacturing base in france for a long time all right so paul uh with the c2 is in ottawa canada thanks for letting us know all right we've got max on board um greetings from the seychelles oh very nice yeah hopefully the weather is doing what it should do there all right um we've got duke on board from southern california all right, ABR with some important uh, advice. Stretches before and after um, is important. You may not feel it for 20 years, <laughs> but you will. Yeah, or if you can't stretch before and after your sailing session, if you can stretch on a regular basis, that is definitely 100% better than not stretching at all. Um yeah, so what we'll do is we'll put together the shortest stretching routine uh, possible, which if you repeat it every day, you will be able to get your leg up on the side of the boat with confidence. There we go. All right, Paul says, I find the main downhaul on my C2 annoying to deal with. NACRA does it a little bit nicer. Any recommendations on how I can improve my c2 downhaul yeah if it is that it's very difficult to cleat then yes um this is an issue but it is an issue which is resolvable so on the c the c2 the i think the downhaul system is a little bit of a work of genius so if this is the trampoline we're looking from the top um on our c2 the downhaul is red thank you um, and the downhaul comes down from the sail and then disappears through a hole in the trampoline. And then all of the purchase is actually on the back side of the front beam. So it goes down here through a turning block, down this way, down this way. Um, I can't remember how many times it goes up and down here. And then it comes out here. And then um, I can't remember, it either goes up the front beam or round the shroud and then back under the trampoline. But um, yeah, it's a very neat system. But the problem is because the cleat is here at deck level, if you're trying to cleat the downhaul, if you're not trapezing quite low, um, it is very difficult to get it in the cleat. Um, so if this is a side view, there's the trampoline, then the cleat is like this. Um, if we go, yeah, so, and then the rope is like this. Um, so one thing you can do is for any cleats, if you want to raise the angle of any cleats on your boat like maybe your jib cleats or something what you can do is you can get for most types of cleat or you could fashion it yourself you can get these wedges that go under the cleat so let's um so Usually your cleat would just mount flat onto a plate and then that plate would probably go back to a, some sort of swivel um, so that it can rotate. So there's the pivot where it rotates. And um, on our, what we found on our C2 here is occasionally these cleats get stood on, which actually makes it worse because this gets bent downwards. Um, so if 
you want it to be easier to cleat if that's the plate what we do is we get a wedge which goes like this and you could get wedges of different angles so if you only want to raise it a little bit you could do that and then the cleat mounts onto the wedge making it much easier to get in the cleat um massively easier so i would look into um getting some wedges for your cleats um and if it is actually if it's not the cleat which is the annoying bit on your downhaul then i um would perhaps suggest having a look on the good old design website for how the uh downhaul is meant to be rooted and just make sure your downhaul is rooted correctly because i do find but it works really really nicely on the c2 um but uh, the only bad point is these cleats are difficult to cleat unless you're trapezing super low all right so um Yeah, ABR says there have been fatalities in the USA on the East Coast uh, with people sailing 420s. Um, yeah, so quick release hook every time. All right, ABR also says Prindle R Nacra. Yeah, um, yeah, so Prindle did get um, evolved into what is now Nacra. And I believe that Nacra, even though uh, NACRA is an acronym, um, which even the word sounds a bit like NACRA, North American Catamaran Racing Association. Um, NACRA, their stronghold is in Holland um, rather than in the USA. So I'd, I'd have to look into the uh, makeup of the of the NACRA company to see where NACRAs are manufactured. I'm sure a lot of them are in the Far East, um, but the actual fiberglass parts um i thought were now manufactured in holland um so we get a huge amount of nacras in europe especially in holland if you haven't got a nacra in your driveway you're not you're not coming to the party uh duke says lots of prindles in texas oh yeah talking to tech you can't speak about texas without saying hello to toot um who we saw in last week's uh show us your cat uh, nice to have you with us too, as always. And thanks again for um, for showing us your cats. Great stuff. All right. Paul says, Nacra is made in Holland. You are correct. Thank you, Paul, for that confirmation. All right. So um, it's all a bit quiet today. Uh, but what we're going to uh, take a look at is from the preloaded questions department got a question from hull flying finn i'm guessing this is someone from finland who likes to fly a hull and who doesn't um he says what are the best um practices in really light wind almost no wind at all um i've had a trouble in long course races where uh the boat actually stopped and big keel boats just sail past. Yeah, there are things that we should be looking at when the wind is super light. Um, I don't know why I've rubbed the board off. I don't know what I'm going to draw. But um, if we start off by looking at our course, as we have established before, our course is the most important. And if we focus on sailing upwind, because upwind is by far the most difficult point of sail to have your boat to get your boat going especially if the wind is super light um then what we want to do uh when the wind is super light is we're going to sail sorry i've got an arrow up here which it doesn't actually make it down all right there we go that's our wind by the way we want to be sailing on a fairly free upwind course so not really pinching it up to the wind we want to make sure 
if our telltales are moving, um, that both of them are flying straight back um, at all times. Because if we keep the boat moving forwards, then it's a win-win. If, if we will be creating this induced wind, which helps us to increase the amount of apparent wind we've got, which helps to keep the boat moving even better. But if we start sailing slowly, this is why everything I'm going to say is so important. Um, if we start sailing slowly, our induced wind is going to fall off, which means um, it's a vicious circle. It's like a multiplied effect of doom um, when we don't have um, the boat moving. So um, we're keeping the boat moving at all times. Very important. So we're not sailing close to the wind. We're just trying to keep the boat moving very nicely. And part of doing this with our course, it's a few things, but part of doing it, number one, is we want to be focused. You've got to have really good, strong focus when the wind is really light. And um, as the helm on the boat, you want to be just absolutely like a hawk watching the telltales on the jib, making sure they are absolutely perfect at all times. And now with the steering, we want to keep the steering at an absolute minimum. Every time you move the rudders, it is going to um, slow the boat down because we're going to put more drag on the back of the boat when they're not straight. Now, this might contradict the fact that we're trying to keep the telltales flying straight back. So you have to weigh up what is better for our boat speed. Is it going to be like if there's if the wind is that light, it is less likely that you're going to have a massive wind shift unless it is like um, um, unless you're sailing near a piece of land where the wind does weird things or uh, other boats or something. But um, yeah, really try to keep the steering down to a minimum. Watch the jib telltales. Make any movements with your steering very, very, very subtle, very subtle. And um, and then, yeah, I think that's pretty much it for the course. And then if you do have to tack, just really think, not of, right, we're going to tack, off we go, boom like you would do in a strong wind, but really think, sail the boat through the tack, not just wang it and it's going to go through. Sail the boat through the tack. Just steer it up into the wind. When the jib backs, um, granted, it's not going to pull you very far or fast, but when the jib backs, maybe increase the rate of turn a little bit at that point. And when you're tacking, let's just talk tacking, uh, entirely at the moment when you're tacking really don't worry about moving across the boat until you're sailing forwards again because as you move across the boat your steering might be slightly disturbed your movement across the boat might disturb the water um, so don't worry about getting across the boat quickly when you're tacking um, yeah so Next thing, sails, sail setting. Just make sure the sails are definitely not in too tight. Much better that they're a little bit too loose than too tight. If at any point your sails are too tight, you're going to stall the sails and you're going to slow down. So, and as we've said, we definitely don't want to slow down. Um, so we're going to watch the telltales on the sails. Again, making sure that they're flying nicely at all times, which means we're just watching the telltales, just making sure that they are flying straight back. If you're sailing um, F-18 style boat with a tall, high aspect rig, um, and we've got leech telltales, have it so just the bottom one is just occasionally disappearing. 
This is assuming that there's enough wind to get your telltales flying. So put your lightweight telltales. That's a joke, actually. Uh, people don't really change the weight of their telltales for the wind strength. Um, yeah, and don't have the sails at any time when the wind is that light pulled in bar tight. Um, I would say one way that um, I think it's good to describe how much main sheet you've got in is the actual angle that your main sheet blocks sit at. So if we're looking from straight behind, if your main sheet blocks are sitting absolutely vertical like that, that would imply that you've got a lot of tension in uh, your main sheet because the mainsail is trying to pull it over to the side. Um, so in light winds, you don't want to have this vertical main sheet. You want to have a bit of angle to it. That's another way that you can look at how much to pull the main sheet in if um, perhaps you're not getting anything out of the telltales. And if at any time you feel that your boat isn't sailing fast enough for the amount of wind, chances are you've got the mainsail in too tight. So just let it out. And then if let it out, give the boat a second to react. If you feel the boat starts to go a bit faster, then that was the problem. And then as your boat does faster, our apparent wind is going to come round a little bit. So, yes, you might be able to sheet in a bit again, but make sure it's not in too tight. All right. Next thing is our, and these are all very important things. Crew positions. We want to be, most important thing, actually, with the crew position is to not move on the boat unless it's necessary. Um, I sailed a race um, back in September, the Ionian regatta, and the wind was really, really light at the start. So um, I had a challenge with uh, the guy that I was sailing with. I said, all right, I just um, want you to move into a different position on the boat. If I felt the boat move at all, like Bob, um, from the movement of a person on the boat, that was a fail. So we were really um, focusing on very subtle movements. So um, in a very kind of like, what would you call it? Like almost like a Tai Chi kind of way across the boat um, so that we're not bouncing the boat up and down as we move. Um, but unless there's a need to move on the boat, we are staying absolutely dead still because any movement on the boat is, again, it's going to it's going to disturb the flow of water around the hulls and it's going to disturb the flow of air around the sails. Our position upwind, um, depending on which type of boat you're on, but the helm will generally always be just behind the front beam. And then if you're sailing on a boat with lower volume hulls like a Hobie uh, 16, then the crew would want to be sort of maybe the other side of the mast um, up by the front beam on the upwind. You may say, you may argue, oh, but wouldn't it be better to put the crew right up the nose? No, because as we know, what we, well, as, as we're, we're establishing here, what is most important at all times when sailing the boat, if you can, apart from on a very deep downwind point of sail, if we can keep the boat dead flat, not down at the front, not down at the back, dead flat, that is the most efficient because we're getting lift from the rudder blades. If we put the bows down, we're going to lift the rudder blades out of the water we're not going to be getting lift from the rudder blades and we're going to be replacing that with more drag from the bows. So we want to keep the boat dead flat. So if you're sailing more of an F-18 style boat with more volume in the hulls, um, then the crew would be just the other side of the front beam. There we go.
but not moving more than the bare minimum. Um, what else could we talk about here on the downwind point of sale? That might be necessary for the crew to actually hold the boom or the bottom of the mainsail out to keep good shape in the sail. Um, yeah, or if you're sailing single-handed, there are some quite interesting positions that people put themselves in. A popular one in the really light stuff would be, I wonder if I can illustrate this, sitting at the front of the boat, if this is the boom, wants to be out here, sitting here with um, feet up on the boom to hold it out, steering the boat. Very nice. Yeah. So most important, keep your steering down to a minimum. Keep your movements down to a minimum. Don't try to sail too close to the wind. Don't pull your sails in too tight and your boat should go better. If um, you have a choice on the race course of um, if you can see that there is a place on the race course where there's more wind. Even if it takes you in the wrong direction a little bit, not the wrong, totally wrong direction, obviously. But um, if if you think that you can almost think of um, what could you think of the stronger bits of wind, like a, a conveyor belt taking you in the right direction. So if this is um, your race course like here, and if you can see that there's a little bit more wind over here or and like maybe right over here, then perhaps when you've gone round the boy. Sorry, I'm going to sneeze. Feel a sneeze coming. Um, if you, When you've gone round the boy, don't sail very close to the wind at all just so you get over to this bit of wind as soon as you possibly can. And then once you're in that wind, then happy days are here again. And granted, you won't have gone like there might be other boats going up here, but you've gone, no, I want to get to that wind sharpish. But then you get to this wind. This guy might be up here, but then you're going twice as fast. It's quite it's quite likely that if you get a bit significant bit more wind when it's that light, uh, you can sail twice as fast as the competition. Yeah, so there we go. All right, so uh, um, yeah, so uh, whole flying fin. I hope that helps. Um, I'm just trying to perform an operation here called Google Translate. I just, um, something I don't understand in the live chat. Um, power. All right. So just, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, there we are. Uh, just like I said, Benny says, I have a Prindle 16, 1978 under restoration. So there is at least one Prindle in Sweden. All right. Um, ABR says secret maritime name for the rudder is the brake. Yes. Uh, will cats respond well to center of effort changes moving weight for and aft? Um Not, not so much with the movements on the boat to change the centre of effort. It's more uh, to get the best profile of the um, of the hull in the water and to keep uh, the right amount of rudder in the water. So dead flat is definitely on most points of sail. In fact, yes, there is one bit that we didn't come on to. And that was downwind in mega light winds. There is something we can do here on the downwind, especially on a, a boat with less volume, like a Hobie 16. Um, sorry, really mixing it up with the colours today.
So if you're sailing downwind, super light wind, you know, like um, almost only just enough wind to be able to sail the boat. Yeah, this is actually a little bit, little bit of an exaggeration. But if we get our weight as far forwards as we can on the downwind, uh, if you're sailing with a crew, helm and crew on opposite sides of the boat and get it so that you've just got about, what, 20 centimetres or so of rudder blade left in the water on the downwind because we don't need that lift off the rudder on the downwind. Um, we can sail as fast as the boats uh, that are trimmed less, but much deeper downwind if we go further forwards. Because as we go further forwards, what we're doing is we're bringing our rig up right, which is presenting more sail area to the wind. So it's going to become much more efficient and um, we can just really give it the hammer downwind. So, yeah, that is the one time when we would really want to get the weight forwards on the downwind mega light winds. All right. So we've got someone in uh, in Russia say. Um, I assume it's Russia. It could be um, or Eastern Europe, perhaps. Oh, no, it is Russia. Greetings from Russia. Yes. Uh, great to have you on board. Hope, uh, hope it's not too cold. Um, nice uh, to have you with us. All right. ABR says center traveler on main sheet block illustration. No weather traveler. No. Um, no, the, the traveller on the upwind is just going to be put just into the middle. That is the spot. Um, because if, sorry, all I'm doing is drawing where the middle is. All right, there we go. In the middle, on the upwind, unless it is absolutely blowing dogs off chains, we don't want to be letting the, the traveller out on the main sheet. Because as soon as we let the traveler out on the main sheet, we no longer have any ability to point. So we're keeping the traveler central. All right, we got Scott in Oregon dropping it in the slot. Um, great to have you with us. ABR says uh, reduction of pitching moment, having crew athwart ships versus separating mass. Yes. Yeah, so what we're trying to do with our helm and crew positions um, at all times to prevent this pitching is to have the helm and the crew as close together as possible in a fore and aft um, way. So um, we can actually put the rest of the trampoline in here. So in the light winds, helm and crew here. So we're on the same line. So you're not going to get this kind of seesawing motion. Whereas if the crew was back here, seesawing. Um, and if we're on the bigger boat, helm and crew right here, almost touching. Or if you know each other, maybe touching. Very good. All right. We've got Mr. Tony KP on board in Denmark. Thanks for coming. Never too late. Must see later. Take care. Leland Lee is on board. Uh, this week, coming from the fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada. Great stuff. Uh, Duke says uh, in uh, Vegas is Fleet 51. So do be sure to check out Fleet 51 in Vegas. All right. And um, just skimming through the live chat. Uh, where to sail uh, near Vegas is Lake Mead, which is super windy uh, when there's enough water. OK. I get the idea that it's not always feasible to sail there. All right. Toot uh, says Lake Buchanan Club, um, which we saw in Show Us Your Cat, has two Hobie 16s for traveling sailors to borrow. So if you want to go to Lake Buchanan, Texas, yes, there is a possibility that you can borrow a boat. All right, bit of chat between everybody. Uh, that's very nice that everybody gets on so well in the live chat. Um, all right, just skimming through. 
Hanny says, is weight of the helm and crew important for their positions? That is a very good question, actually. Um, would it be better if you've got a helm and a crew who have got, let's say they've got the equal amount of skills on the boat, but let's say the uh, one person is half the weight of the other person what would be beneficial um it would generally like as shown in so many classes of monohull especially generally it's better to have a crew who is the bigger person because um the crew has a lot more um possibility to move around the boats and to really make the most of their weight so um, if it's gusty conditions, they could be moving in and out on the trapeze quite readily. And I would say it's better to have a smaller helm, bigger crew until it gets to super windy, like or 20 knots plus when you're constantly double trapezing on the upwind. And then on the downwind, you want to be getting as much weight back as possible at all times, which means having a heavier helm when it's really windy is going to help. In these mega light winds that we've been talking about, um, then, yeah, it's not really such a consideration here. I think you could go either way when it's super light, but in a medium amount of wind, so from six knots right through to 16 knots, let's say, or even 18 knots, then in an ideal world with an equal skill set from the helm, from both sailors, better to have the lighter person helming and the heavier person responsible for uh, the subtle balancing of the boat, I would say. All right, Duke says, last question, what do you do in an orca attack? Gosh, um, yeah, that's a tough one, Duke. I haven't got a good answer for that at this time. What would what would I do? I would um, I would probably. I'm just actually thinking about what I'd do if I was being attacked by any sea creature. I would probably opt for standing up on the trampoline, um, holding on to the rigging and the mast by by standing up on the trampoline it means you've got a better chance of spotting um whatever it is that's attacking you so that you can make sure you're not on the side of the boat where it's coming to so if it's if um this if this big fella is um is coming from here you could be right i'm going to be over here um to try to make sure that if he is going to take a what a bite um you're not going to be part of that bite you know hopefully if you were being attacked by anything with teeth if they have a bite of the boat and realise that fibreglass really does get stuck in your teeth, doesn't taste good, hasn't got much calorific value or nutritional value, it will probably give up after a bit, after it realises that it's not very nice. Um, so that perhaps would be my strategy. Um, <laughs> but um, we haven't had so many orcas in Vasiliki Bay of late. So thanks for the question there. All right. Uh, Derek says hello from Lake Okanagan, approximately 72 miles wide, two uh, long and two miles wide. Nice. All right. And that is in Canada. Nice to have you on board. All right. Ryan says sheet in in the event of a orca attack. Yeah, I suppose in Hawaii, you must get some sort of sea creatures that are looking to have a pop. Duke says, uh, oh, God. We have orcas in Southern California. It's real. 
uh, orcas are playing with rudder. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, this is a poor situation. Duke says, bring an oar and poke them with the oar. There we go. So I think we're going to wind this up here. Uh, thanks to everybody who's come live. Thanks to everybody who is uh, watching this later on as well. If you've got a spare finger, please do hit the like button. If you're not yet subscribed to Joyrider TV, of course, you should subscribe. And um, I'll be back soon with some more. Um, but if you would like to show us your cat, send me an email, totaljoyrider at icloud.com. Um, show us your cat because it's your cats that are showing us, show us your cat. Without your cats, we've got nothing to show. And I'll see you soon uh, with some more. Uh, thank you very much. Goodbye and have a lovely weekend.